the hope that vocational education is going to be the thing that's going to fix the economy and lead to rebuilding and growth after COVID. So in many countries, we're seeing an emphasis on vocational education as necessary to support economic recovery and individual livelihoods. And what we're seeing linked to this is a set of kind of rules and tools that are supposed to facilitate better analysis of demand for skills and therefore better production of appropriate skills to meet the needs of econ econ economic recovery. Um, these rules and tools include things like um, involving employers in the development of competency standards, managed autonomy for institutions through market and quasi-market policies, quality assurance to regulate all of this. Simon McGrath has referred to this in the past as a, as a TVET toolbox. Um, and so in, as part of this toolbox, what we see is linking funding to allegedly demand-driven educational provision through small pieces of qualifications or competence statements with the idea being that if employers specify the exact skills and competencies that they require, and if we give education and training institutions funding, um, they will develop courses that lead to these exact co competencies, and then we'll no longer have uh, what some people like to refer to as a skills mismatch. So for over 40 years, people, advocates have been saying that this will enable education institutions to provide only the required competencies and thereby enable the consumers, whether they are employers employing um, people in labor markets or individuals trying to get relevant skills, um, whether whichever of those is seen as consumers, it will enable consumers to purchase only the relevant bits of education and training without having to sit through long educational programs. This is an old set of policies which hasn't had great success. What we're seeing now is a very aggressive recurrence of this, pushed mainly by the ed, oh, not mainly, but considerably by the ed tech industry in the form of the idea of micro credentials, which we are told will ensure responsive, agile, demand-led vocational education. And um, those of you who did come to our, the first seminar in this series um, will have heard the presentation by Lisa Wheelahan on micro-credentials for the gig economy. There is a link to it on this slide. We'll share the slides um, as well as the other, two, the other two seminars that have already taken place in this seminar series. Another aspect of this rules and tools for education supply and demand is tools for skills anticipation. So in South Africa, we have many years of attempting to improve our skills anticipation systems. We mainly do it through the aggregation of employer specified gaps or employer specified vacancies. And that has a lot of problems, which we could talk about later. Um, we have in South Africa a strong emphasis on the production of lists of skills which are in demand or which are scarce. Um, we also have many structures and systems for formal engagement with stakeholders, and yet we don't seem to be able to figure out what is the demand and how can we ensure that there's the appropriate supply of skills. Um, not because we don't have a plethora of forums for stakeholder engagement, employer input, and so on, and we see that in many countries across the African continent. We see countries increasingly creating structures like sexual skills councils to build employer engagement at a sexual level. In South Africa, we, we call them sexual education and training authorities. Um, and in research, I, I want to share just um, two slides from research that um, I've been doing for the International Labour Organization, and I'm really happy that some colleagues from the ILO are here today. Um, this is very much work in progress, and the report has not yet been um, finalized, so it will obviously be shared later, but I'm just giving a little dip into some of the emerging pictures. And what's interesting is that when we asked employer associations, are they involved in the development of national skills development strategy or TVET strategy, most of them are very involved and somewhat involved, and the vast majority are involved. Um, that's the issue countries. This is the employer associations from the French speaking countries. And we see a similar picture with um, trade union federations. So this would indicate strong stakeholder involvement. And this is um, from a, a large set of countries, well over 50% of 
African countries. We also asked them about other forms of involvement and the picture is much more complex, but as I said, we'll share, the, we'll share that when the report is finalized. But the point that we have to confront is that our formal rules and tools have not yet changed the basic picture that we see in developing countries of very small and very weak formal provision systems with little pockets of, of success stories and strong provision. And I suggest that this is because we're thinking about it wrong. And if we really want to understand um, how to develop or the skills development, what's actually happening and how to build on what's actually happening, we need to move beyond the idea of supply and demand, which is really an idea that comes from um, the study of markets, commodity markets, um, because skills are not a simple commodity for a whole range of different reasons. And so the metaphor of supply and demand leads to very unhelpful policy ideas. One of the problems with the, the idea of supply and demand of skills is captured in the idea of skill, which as I already suggested is a kind of a problematic term because it simplifies what is a complex mixture of theoretical and applied knowledge that is required, that is acquired through education and training and workplace experience. And so um, as Palessa said in, our, in the introduction, a lot of the work that we do at the Real Center focuses on perspectives on knowledge, curriculum and learning. This is not going to be what I'm focusing on today, but I'm just mentioning it because it is an important set of issues in relation to problematizing supply and demand. Um, this is the book that um, Palesa mentioned, for those of you who do want to see our research in this area. I've also put up two publications from our um, a, a, a visiting researcher and close associated real, um, Jean Gamble, which are also very, very important recent contributions in this area. And just to highlight the importance of thinking about knowledge, which I'm not going to be doing today. Um, we also have a number of PhD students work in this regard. But what I want to, uh, another issue um, which we need to think about in relation to skills is that there, and another reason why they can't be treated as a simple commodity in a simple commodity market is that you can't separate the skill from the bearer of the skill, nor from the nature of work organization. And that impinges, that is, that is created by the skills and abilities of managers. So policy notions of supply and demand of skills tend to underestimate um, that the ability of education to prepare for work is shaped by the ways in which work is organized. Here, I want to um, really remind everyone about the um, presentation that Hugh Lauda did in our um, second seminar series on his on the book, um, The Death of Human Capital Theory, which really um, goes into a lot of these issues and I think is, is really worth reading in this regard, as we said in that seminar. Um, so I won't go into that again, except to make one point, and that is that one of the problems when we look at policies that try to match skill supply with skills demand is that they often don't distinguish between qualifications and skills. Um, in other words, they don't distinguish between the knowledge and skills required to do work and the re credentials required to get a job. Um, the latter is often more relevant in labor markets, the former is often more relevant in workplaces, but they are often very different. So we have to distinguish analytically between the substance of education, which matters in the labor process or what actually happens in the workplace, and for all the other roles, obviously, that education plays in society, but we're focusing on educational preparation for work here, and the sorting role of ed educational credentials in labor markets. Because um, to the extent that education and via credentials is used for signaling by prospective job applicants or screening by employers, it's um, uh, credentials are a pos positional good and positional goods have absolute limits on their supply. Supplying more education to more people is wonderful developmentally. Um, it provides more people with the opportunity to learn, but it doesn't improve the positional gains made by uh, obtaining particular educational levels, which is why we see um, the phenomenon of credential inflation, which I think uh, this, this slide actually captures nicely both the, the notion of credential inflation as well as the problematic of what knowledge and skills are needed to do different jobs. And one of the worst things about giving Zoom presentations is that when you make a joke, you have no idea whether anyone's 
found it funny or not. Um, but anyway, we just have to push on in this um, strange new world of ours. The point is that the distinction is important in understanding the difficulties of vocational education systems in poor countries, and particularly important in understanding the limitations of micro-credentials. So that's the, the knowledge and skills issues and the complexities of that, the knowledge and curriculum issues, the distinction between knowledge, skills on the one hand and credentials on the other. But what I'm going to move on to and what's going to be the um, substance of my presentation is um, that the notion of skill supply and demand has an implicit kind of assumption that there's a place somewhere in a country where skills are produced and another place where skills are purchased and used. But when we actually look at the literature on skill formation, what's really clear is that skills are produced in the economy, not outside of the economy, for the economy. And the nature of the economy, and in particular, the nature and structure of labor markets, although a whole other range of aspects of e economic policy and social policy also is important, but the nature of the economy shapes the nature of skills produced. Um, the knowledge and skills required to do work aren't developed somewhere outside and then supplied to the economy. So the point is that skill formation is embedded in economic, social, political arrangement systems and policies. Um, and here I want to just um, mention the seminar that we had most recently by Ken Spurs, where he looked at skills ecosystems, which can also be found on the link that I um, showed earlier. So what's crucial if we look at the, the literature, the comparative literature on skill formation systems is the, this, this important factor that um, the, the, the differences in context mean that vocational education and training systems actually in wealthy countries look really different to each other. They don't look the same as each other at all. Um, and this is because economies, political systems, and social policy are different, and they shape vocational education systems in a, um, they, they shape how, how big it is relative to school enrollments and, and university enrollments. They shape how it's perceived in society. And also importantly, they shape the extent to which vocational education is offered through apprenticeship type arrangements and the extent to which it's offered through education institutions, schools or colleges. So th those are the key ways in which vocational education systems differ in wealthy countries from each other. There's stark differences in terms of when does specialization start? When do young people um, split up into general academic streams and vocational streams? How different are the vocational and general streams? Um, and how many students in the upper secondary system or in a vocational stream. That, that differs dramatically across wealthy countries. Um, another key dimension of variation is the role of companies, as I said, the extent and nature of workplace-based training and whether or not VET takes place through apprenticeships. Um, and a third one is the extent to which vocational education is socially a socially valued op option or a stigmatized second class alternative to general education. And historically, we only see a small number of countries that are seen as consistently having produced strong vocational education that enrolls a large percentage of the um, age cohort that is offered um, that with very large numbers through workplace based training um, and is very well, well regarded um, socially. And those are the German speaking European countries as well as a few other European countries. We do see some examples though of success elsewhere in the world, particularly um, the Asian tigers during the kind of developmental in, in industrialization phase um, and Latin American countries with a very strongly employer led um, system during the import sub substitution industrialization phase. What we see in most other wealthy countries, and here I just want to emphasize that we that they don't that the systems don't look the same because the structure of the economies are different. What we see is that in general, what in general, general, what we see is that general education, schooling, and university 
um, kind of preparatory education plays more of a role in the in transitions to work, plays more of a role in, in educational preparation for work, and VET is more, is, becomes more in a residual compensatory and therefore lower status role, obviously with exceptions and pockets of good, um, really good and well-regarded um, VET provision. But what we see is this pattern is even more pronounced in poor countries, and that's what I really want to turn to now. So I just want to show a few insights from comparative research from two studies that are currently underway. One is a six country study that we're in working with colleagues in um, a number of other countries um, called the Skills for Industry Study. Um, the study uh, of the countries are the countries that we're studying are Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Laos, South Africa, and Vietnam. But I should mention that the the project is uh, that is is um, led by a team in Zurich. Um, and the other research that I want to mention is ongoing research at the Real Center, looking at skill formation systems across Africa. And from both studies, what we see is one overriding contextual structural similarity across a very different set of poor and middle income countries that seems to dominate the nature of vocational education and that is the structure of labor markets so what's interesting if you look at these six countries from the skills for industry study as well as the the, the number of african countries that we've looked at in our skill formation research is that as I said, the formal, the, the formal VET systems in wealthy industrialized countries differ dramatically. And I mentioned three dimensions that they vary um, against. What we see against those three dimensions in poor countries is that systems tend to look quite similar. In terms of tracking or specialization, it happens after junior secondary education. In terms of the size and nature of vocational enrollments, they are really small compared to school enrollments and compared to university enrollments. And they are mainly school or college based. Workplace or apprenticeship enrollments are a fraction of these enrollments and vocational education is stigmatized. Now, you know, on the surface of it, what I, I said earlier that context, the nature of the economy, political system, social policy, and so on, is so important in shaping the nature of skill formation. Now, these six countries and the Skills for Industry project are really different. They have dramatically different histories in terms of state formation. They're dramatically different in terms of geographic and population size, both of which should affect the ability of national governments to steer or coordinate vocational education to steer and coordinate supply and demand of skills. Um, five of the countries have shown dynamism and a trajectory towards industrial growth. Here, yeah, South Africa is sadly the exception. Um, there's strong differences in labor market absorption. In Cambodia, um, labor demand generally exceeds supply and vocational education graduates find employment. Vietnam, they have a high placement rate. Um, in Laos also, although some researchers suggest that that's mainly in the public sector. Um, but what, and five of the countries, again, South Africa is the exception, um, and this is the pattern again across Africa, have very low unemployment and extremely high levels of informal or casual survivalist work. In South Africa, what we see instead is incredibly high levels of unemployment, even before the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we would expect the skill formation systems to look different, but what they have in common, and it seems to be a factor that kind of overrides the other factors, is very small formal sector employment. Um, and as I said, either high numbers of informal casual employment in most of the countries or unemployment in South Africa, and also the education profile of those employed in the formal sector is high. And this shouldn't surprise us when we go back to thinking about the point about credentials that I made earlier, particularly in the context where secondary school enrollments are rising rapidly and university enrollments are rising rapidly. So, um, and, and, and my research into skill formation systems in Africa tells a very similar story. Um, yeah, maybe I'll skip some of the details here. But the, the point is that labor markets, which have 
there, which have limited rewards um, can increase intense positional competition for credentials, particularly in the context of mass expansion of schooling um, and mass expansion of university education. And um, positional competition for credentials tends to have a very negative effect on vocational education because employers tend to hire potential workers with secondary education. Why? Because they tend to see them as having more potential um, because they've been more successful in the formal education and training system to date and professional and higher level jobs are filled with graduates and increasingly that gets pushed down. And so mid-level jobs are increasingly also filled with graduates. What this does is it reinforces low labor market prospects for vocational education graduates, even when they do find employment of some kind, as I, as I mentioned, for um, five of the six countries in our skills for industry study. So what we see is a massive gulf between winners and losers in labor markets. Um, a tiny pool of winners, which also reinforces positional competition for credentials. And this is visible in most of the African countries where we're studying skill formation systems. Um, this is a paper um, which elaborates on this for those of you who want to read further. And it's in a, a recent book produced by the Southern Center for Inequality Studies at WITS, which is one of our important um, research partners. So the, 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 the argument that I'm trying to make is that the failure of vocational education to attract students and the vocational education graduates to be attractive to employers results from labor markets with small numbers of stable, well-paying jobs, as well as from dramatic educational expansion of secondary schooling and higher education, which aren't bad things in their own right, um, but, but, but they have an effect on the overall picture of the skill formation system in the absence of structural change to labor markets. Um, sorry, wait, I, I won't talk about that one yet. So um, the, next, the, the last point that I wanna make about the problem with the supply and demand metaphor is that it tends to be blind to the full picture of training. So what also what emerges from our analysis of the vocational education systems in the skills for industry research, as well as the African skill formation research, is that they're not the, the, the vocational education systems look the same because they're not organically linked to economies, workplaces or labor markets as they are in wealthy countries where they consequently look very different from each other, but they are strongly shaped by the, 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 the lack of structural change in labor markets. And what we see, unfortunately, is that they really seem to be aimed at diverting uh, an increasing number of secondary school completers from university education while re re maintaining state legitimacy by offering, ensuring that there are educational options available for school completers. And certainly individuals and families appear to perceive VET in this way as a second rate educational alternative, as opposed to a preparation for skilled and rewarding work, which reinforces the vicious cycles of low quality and low status. Now, that's the, I've been talking about the formal vocational education and training systems. There's enormous differences across these countries if we look beyond the formal provision in terms of non-formal courses offered, um, through um, non-governmental organizations, but more importantly, non-formal, formal and informal learning that happens in workplaces. And in all six countries, although we don't have strong apprenticeship systems, we do have extensive on-the-job training of different kinds with different, differing degrees of formality. This is often missed by researchers, except for obviously the phenomenon of informal apprenticeships, which is a phenomenon that is really fairly well researched, especially in West Africa, um, mainly thanks to the efforts of the ILO. Um, but the point here, I want to remind us of the point that I made early on, that the knowledge and skills acquired to do work are developed through a complex mix of formal preparatory education programs, relatively formal on the job training, sometimes fully formalized on the job training, and sometimes simply learning from experience. But in many poor countries, we have an extreme lack of data on training that isn't part of formal vocational education provision, and particularly what is happening.
basis, which is probably why we design policy mechanisms and policy systems that actually don't support fund and work with this full range of vocational provision. And that's really what we're trying to currently research in our various research projects. Um, so for example, in the um, ILO study that I've, I've just realized that my slides are actually in the wrong order. I'm going to have to come back to that one. But um, this is another, um, just an interesting snippet from the, the research that I mentioned earlier for the ILO, um, where we find an interesting difference in perceptions on in-service training from um, employer associations on the one hand and companies on the other hand. So when we asked employer associations, what is the dominant way in which your companies provide training. Um, and we asked it for two different occupational levels. I'm just going to talk about one of them now. They mainly reported, this is the English speaking, and here you can see the French speaking, a few differences across them, but they strongly, they strongly uh, um, suggested that the dominant form of training is formal apprenticeships and formal internships supplemented by informal on the job training. Um, a, a stronger emphasis on formal internships here, less on apprenticeships, um, but quite a different picture when we look at, when we asked companies, companies suggest that the dominant form of training is informal on the job training and what you can't see in the slide, unfortunately the graph cuts it off, is that um, this is informal on the job training offered in conjunction with a public education provider. Now, the, our sample of companies is very small relative to the total companies. Our, sam our sample of um, employer associations is, is much more robust, um, but nonetheless, it's still a kind of an interesting um, tidbit because and, and it's despite the fact that most of the company responses are from companies in manufacturing, which is where we would expect to see the highest use of apprenticeships, while the employer associations are representing employers across the economy. Um, I think it's just an interesting tidbit because in skills policy, we see constant development of policy for what we think is happening, what employer associations might think is happening, but also what we think should happen and what we really wish would happen. But seldom do we get back to what is actually happening and build from that. And that's what we need far more insight into in specific sectors in order to be able to analyze the full package of provision across different occupational levels in the workforce, which, which, are, which look quite different. And, and uh, including formal training from education providers, formal training in workplaces, non-formal training in workplaces, and simple learning from experience. And these relationships differ at different occupational levels, but also in different workplace environments. So in our skills for industry research, for example, in, in our um, South African component of the research, we found relatively, a, a relatively successful picture of skill formation within the automotive industry where there's a lot of education and training provided by workplace providers, but also relationships with formal public and private providers. Conversely, we see a complete absence of this in the clothing and textile industry, despite active engagement of the unions in an attempt to save the industry, despite involvement of the sectoral education and training authority, what is a a sector skills council in other countries, as well as strong political commitment to transforming the industry. But what we do see is that the companies in our study are training. They're just not engaging with the formal training system much with a few very small exceptions. But they are training and this training is integrated into hiring and career progression. So the point is that we need a better picture of these relationships and that's, I wanted to talk about this book only now I put the slide in the wrong place. It's just a, a very interesting recent publication by colleagues at the Human Science Research Council. What's interesting about it is that they present case studies from South Africa of highly networked sectors where there are really strong relationships um, across provision and um, employment. So they look at the um, sugar industry in South Africa. They look at the square kilometer array in the Karoo, which is an example of a, a workplace integrated into the full array of education and training levels in its local area. And I, I just wanna recommend the book because the case studies offer insights into what our research is really arguing for, which is that vocational education has to be embedded in 
industrial strategies and industrial policies through meaningful and ongoing relationships, but not the, the formal rules and tools that we have to do this don't seem to be working. And where we don't have the kind of organic relationships that are discussed in the case studies in that book, um, the, the, the issue is what should we then do? So to reflect a little bit, and this is my closing um, set of comments on what we should do, I want to talk a little bit about the COVID skills strategy in South Africa, um, which we were involved in. Um, I worked on with our another a research associate at Real Carmel, Maroc. We were supporting the Department of Higher Education and Training to develop a skill strategy to supplement, to, to support the economic recovery and reconstruction plan, which was launched in October last year. And there's a couple of reasons why I think that this policy is interesting and worth thinking about in terms of definitely not solving um, all of the complex problems that I've laid out before us today, but at least offering a couple of ideas for how we could start thinking about moving away from the supply and demand notion and looking at a more holistic sense of vocational education and training. So the first point here, um, is that the economic re re recovery and reconstruction plan um, is specifically focused on creating demand, on creating structural economic change. And I think we can't emphasize that often enough. I'm not saying that it will succeed, it may well fail, but we usually think of skills policies in the hope that there will be change as opposed to embedding them in policies that are actually directly trying to lead to structural economic change. Because as I showed from the analysis of labor markets, if we just change the supply of education in the absence of structural economic change, um, we will not be able to build the kind of skills that we believe are necessary for our economy. So that's the first important point. Um, now, of course, I'm arguing that skills should be embedded in policies and skills were not embedded in this policy. Um, but when we were asked to support the um, work on developing a skills strategy to, um, to assist with the implementation of the ERRP, as it's referred to, we set ourselves the task of considering how can this actually be done um, what can be done in the education and training system that really is part of and integrated into the strategy that supports the strategy, but also uses the change that this strategy is trying to bring about in order to change and build the education and training system. So the COVID skills strategy consists of a set of core interventions, six core interventions, and a set of six systemic interventions. And I'm just gonna um, talk about a few of them just to give you a, a kind of a little bit of a flavor of, of how we tried to do this. So for example, um, the first one, which is access to targeted skills programs. Um, now, you know, uh, all policies have said for many years that we want targeted skills programs to meet specific short-term needs of employers. So the question would be, you know, and, and, and when we, when, what tends to happen in the development of skills policies is we tend to kind of say, we're gonna do this, but not look at how we're gonna do it and what are the obstacles to doing it? So what the intervention is in this instance is amending the funding and quality assurance mechanisms linked to very specific sectors that are targeted. And I showed those on the previous slide. Um, so it's short-term adjustments to quality assurance requirements for qualifications and programs, as well as short-term adjustments to funding mechanisms to ensure that funding is directed at these immediate training needs. But without destabilizing the broader quality assurance and funding system, because it has to be done in association with support from industry bodies and government departments, um, and, uh, and the sectors aligned to the ERRP. So for example, the initial focus here is primarily in the digital space um, and, some, and, and some in the global business service industry. Okay, another example, the second provision oriented intervention is ensuring that um, the updating of, of um, technical and vocational education programs. So here we're looking at programs that are offered through the vocational colleges, as well as through universities of technology. And the idea here is to 
regional providers with small adjustments to broader programs. So not to think that a whole program can shift in relation to short term changes in the labor market, but to recognize, for example, that when new ventilators are being brought into the country, um, you know, a, a, a small module can be added to a broader diploma or a broader um, certificate that looks specifically at the installation and maintenance of those machines. Um, yeah. So another example is um, retraining. This is the, uh, I think it's the third intervention. Re no, the fourth. Retraining to, pre to preserve jobs. Now here, the intervention is a funding one. And I'm, I'm emphasizing this because, um, you know, many people know um, the ILO has recently commissioned a study that South Africa has a skills levy system. Um, and skills levy systems are supposed to incentivize relevant training, but don't always succeed very well in doing that. So through our recent um, job summit in 2019, um, and a, a scheme called TERS, the Te Temporary Employment Relief Scheme was introduced. And one of the crucial things was a funding window through the CETAs, the Sectoral Education and Training Authorities, specifically aimed at retraining workers who had lost their jobs. And so what we're trying to do is build on um, something that is already happening and that there has been some learning about and make funding much more targeted and much more focused. Um, so, so that's um, some examples. I'll just mention one more, and that is, um, and this is number eight, embedding skills planning into sectoral processes. So the, the emphasis on this intervention is on ongoing focused engagement, not seeing um, the demand side as something, you know, we just got to get right. We've just got to ask the employers, what is it that you need? And then we can just tell that to the um, education providers, but rather getting the education providers inside of processes like um, we've got things called master plan structures in industries where there are um, industrial strategies and industrial policies, um, where the dialogue that we need between education institutions and, um, and employers is, is much deeper and much more extensive than simply what are the missing skills. And it, 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 it extends to, for example, provision arrangements and making sure the provision arrangements are actually appropriate for the needs of different industries. So that's just a couple of examples of looking at actual sectors, actual workplaces, and trying to make policies more nuanced and more focused. Now, you know, um, having said all this, and this is my conclusion, um, it remains an open question whether developing countries should only have very small, strong niche systems of vet provision and let go of the policy goal, which most of us have, which is of unrealized in, in, I think I could probably say all poor countries, but a policy goal in most of streaming large percentages of senior secondary students into vocational education. Whether or not we wanna let go of that, what's clear is that our current rules and tools that attempt to create agility and responsiveness and to improve the coordination of supply and demand don't work in their own terms. And they're unlikely to do so in the context of economic and job recovery. Um, the market-led models, the qualification-led reform, which micro-credentials are a part of, which claim to direct um, demand-led provision um, and which are gaining prominence because of the pandemic will not make provision more responsive and agile. In fact, to date, they've had the opposite effect and this is likely to continue to be the case. So um, what we need instead is um, to build and we need to start thinking about all the moving parts in the economy, the institutional configuration and systems that shape skill formation as we move forward um, with a weak, econo weak economies, and this is particularly a crisis in South Africa, we need to, in this context, build and support education providing institutions as opposed to trying to keep them hungry um, in the idea that that will make them responsive. We need institutions that can offer broad vocational qualifications that, that include general education, but also very focused components of locally needed skills. We also need short programs with simpler accreditation and funding models um, to be responsive to very short term changes in labor markets. Um, 
We need skills to be incorporated into industrial policy processes, not seen as an, or development plans, not seen as an add-on or something kind of exogenous that just needs to be also done. Um, and this means that we really need industry specific as opposed to general vocational education strategies, which we don't see in many countries. For example, in South Africa, we have many funding and incentive mechanisms, but they're kind of blunt and one size fits all. And I was giving examples of where we've been trying to um, show where they need to be slightly more nuanced for specific contexts and, and specific reasons. We need to think about the quality of work organization, um, of, at, in workplaces, as well as skills development inside industrial policy. And we need partnerships, but they must go beyond the kind of formal partnerships that we have um, with high level um, stakeholders. Because as I've been trying to emphasize, skills are built and developed in the economy and society. They're not supplied exogenously to the economy or to labor markets by education institutions. And this requires a better balance between coordinating and supporting a flourishing provision system as well as a more flexible system that supports institution building. Um, and so that's why I'm really emphasizing just as the very last point, vocational education that is broad, that focuses on occupational streams, clusters, as opposed to um, very narrow um, job preparation, in addition to, as I mentioned, very targeted short programs. Um, so yeah, so that's just a couple of questions that I thought um, I'd love to hear people's answers to. Um, I thought before people start uh, throwing difficult questions at me, I could instead uh, throw some difficult questions at all of you. Um, and uh, yeah, as a very final point, um, of just a quick advertising moment. Um, enrollments are currently open for our master's program. So if anyone is on the seminar today, is um, knows anyone who would be interested in doing a master's in education and work and exploring some of these really fascinating and incredibly complicated and difficult issues that I've been talking about, then please do get in touch with us. And um, I'm gonna end on that note. And I haven't looked at any of the chats so I'll start looking at them now. And um, I assume that Prisha is also going to be taking the questions. Thank you so much, Steph. I think you've, uh, that was very, that was a great uh, seminar. Now you've given people a lot to think about and thrown many questions at them. So I'm sure there's going to be uh, a lot of discussion in the time that we have available. So colleagues, the chat is open, so please feel free to leave your uh, questions in the chat for us. And there have been a couple of questions already, Steph, but I think I'm going to start with a colleague that has had his hand up for a very long time. So let's hear another voice. So Surendra, I'm going to give you uh, the opportunity to talk. You've had your hand up for quite a while. Stephanie obviously intrigued you quite early on in the in her, her webinar. So Surendra, you should be able to speak now. If you can just introduce yourself, Surendra, and then you can ask Steph your question. I think you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Maybe he stepped away after waiting for us for a while. Uh, Sylvia, I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk, Sylvia. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Stephanie. That was absolutely excellent. Thoroughly enjoyed that uh, presentation of yours. Um, uh, I'm not going to um, ask a question. I'm going to make two observations, if I may, please. Um, one comes from decades of work experience. One of the issues I think may be relevant to this lack of coordination is the assumption from an academic perspective that businesses run according to the way business schools think they run. And my personal experience is that that's not how they run. And the point that's related to that is for researchers to ask the question, where does the 
the work come from? Who are the clients? What is the what is the product, and how do you get it? Because in very large multinational organizations, you have a continuity. But in small to medium, it's very opportunistic. It's short term. So they literally cannot plan forward because they don't know what they're going to have. And I think that's part of the reason for the disjuncture because they're being asked to plan for a year forward, but they literally don't know whether they'll have the work for a year forward. I think that might be relevant. And then just the current observation, uh, this comes from our current employment in terms of portal publishing. This is digital publishing. The problem is that it's changing day by day. So having any kind of qualification that's over an extensive period is going to be difficult. And what is needed is a combination, I think, of shorter, very short, quickly put in place, quality assured programs that are absolutely relevant to what's happening in the digital world today. Those are my observations. I Thank hope they're useful. Um, I'll respond to those and also some of the points that are made in the chat. Um, I, I really am a bit agitated about um, Bill Esmond's comment. So I need to comment. I need to just clarify what I was saying there. Um, but Sylvia, I think that that's, I mean, look, I think you're, one of your points is, is really um, speaks to why um, skills anticipation systems that are based on an aggregation of employer um, analysis of, ne of skills needs are very limited. Not that we shouldn't be asking employers, but there's just an extreme limitation to, to what they know um, they need currently, never mind what they'll need um, in the future. The, I, I don't agree that we need lots of short programs. And I think that there's a contradiction, a, a difficult one between quality assured and short and responsive. That's what we were really trying to grapple with. Um, in, that inter in that first intervention in the COVID skills strategy and find alternative mechanisms um, for, for very short programs where there are, skill, where there are identified industry skills needs. Um, I think that general long-term training programs are, are absolutely crucial for all workers and increasingly so in the changing world of work. Supplemented by short, very short term specific targeted training. But Bill, um, your, your question, which I think is such an important one, and I'm so glad you asked it because I hope that other people also um, didn't think I was saying this. You say skills are produced in the economy, giving the example of the success of Germany. Um, isn't that problematic because it suggests that schooling can only be preparatory for work um, and has no role in generalizing or deepening the practical learning of young workers. The, the point that I'm trying to make when I say that skills are produced in the economy is that schools are part of the economy. Schools aren't separate from the economy. So the whole picture of, you know, the, the, we, we can't think of the whole education and training system, including schools, including universities, including colleges, including workplace learning, as things where skills are produced and the economy as things where skills are used. They're part of the economy. They, they are the way they look that is because of what the economy looks like. Um, I, I, we had a, um, an article in um, a series in a South African um, publication, which we can share with colleagues if you're interested. Someone could put it in the link in, in New Frame on why schooling is failing. And despite the aspiration of many economists, schooling doesn't seem to be um, at all rupturing inequalities in South Africa. And we're arguing that it can't because our schools are shaped by our economy. So that's really what I was trying to argue when I was talking about skills being produced in the economy and not that there's somewhere kind of outside of the economy. I wasn't trying to say that only workplace-based learning models should are important or are where skills that are preparatory for work are produced. And in fact, I think that um, we're never going to have mass apprenticeship models in the poor countries or middle income countries that I was talking about. Although policymakers love it, they love it because why? They look at countries with a big apprenticeship systems and say, see, oh, they have low unemployment. Um, but we don't know what the causal relationships are there. So um, 
yeah so so i don't i don't i think that um, educational preparation for work in formal education institutions is absolutely crucial and we have to think about it. Um, it's just that I don't want us to think about it as something separate for, and the economy as something separate from it. So that was the point that I was that I was trying to make there. So thank you so much for that point. Um, so Steph, yeah. Farad yes. has got two related kind of questions. Okay. So his first question is asking you, about what are your thoughts on how we can resolve mismatch in liberal markets with unregulated structures? And then he's asking a, a, a follow-up question around constraints with skill strategies in countries with varied political and economic structures. We can pick up. Yeah. So, and I, th I think those are great questions. And I think that, you know, the answer is, if I, I think, you know, what I was referring to as rules and tools, in a sense that they have tried to do that. And that's why you see them mainly in liberal market um, economies and developing countries where this kind of relates to your question, Mike, Klaus, and which I, I hope to come back to. But um, they relate to the kind of policies and systems that are suggested to poor and middle income countries, um, which are about trying to create a formal set of structures and institutions to replace what doesn't exist organically in the economy. Um, now, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for why people would want to do that. Um, and there are some places where it works to some extent, but the point is that it, it, it's very, very limited. Um, so I think that we have to start from the reality of what economies look like and think about what needs to be changed in the whole economy if we want to change the way skills are produced. Do we need to change the regulation of labor markets? Do we need to change, um, I know Kenya have tried to do this in an interesting way, um, you, do we need to cap university enrollments? Um, do we need to, there's a whole range of different things that we might want to look at. Um, but I don't think what we can do is go, oh, look, there's these coordinated market economies. And wow, they've developed such great skill systems because they've got good coordination and state control. So let's get some formal systems that do coordination and state control and we'll be able to also have good skill systems. The skill system is always going to reflect the economy, the structure of the economy, the labor market, the social policy that exists. Um, we might change more things by providing um, free early childcare than um, by having a skills coordinating structure. So, so that's what I'm really trying to emphasize that, that um, we can't only look at le levers and policies that, that formally bring people together. Because if you look at South Africa, we have all of them. We have coordination and stakeholder engagement and dialogue at a national, at a sectoral, at a local, at a qualification design, at, a, at every level. Um, and yet, you know, all the employers are saying they don't have the skills that they need. So we have to start looking at skills as part of a set of economic and social and political policies and systems and saying, okay, if we want something different here, how can we, what are the other things that we also have to change? So, yeah, so that's that's my view on that issue. Okay. And I would love it if people um, wanted to come in and talk about something. Yeah, Ail has posted in the, in the chat um, mm -hmm. the link to the, our piece on education and inequality, which really looks at schools as part of the economy and not as a kind of a solution to um, economic problems. Okay, Steph, do you want to pick up Mike Clausen's question around the role of donor-funded projects and uh, what they're reinforcing in terms of VET? I mean, I just, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question, Mike, but I, I do think that, I think that sometimes they are really successful and there's amazing examples of success. Often though, at incredible cost, when you break down the kind of student to, to, um, to dollar ratio. Um, and 
that could be justifiable if they were scalable, but often they're not. Um, and often they're useful, even at great cost. And I, and I really think that it's because they're, they're looking at just trying to change skills outside of trying to change other things. And I also think that um, they, um, they, 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 they often are, are so aspirational in terms of what, what donors and policymakers wish vocational education would look like, what they wish learners would desire, um, that they don't start. And I, and I just want to emphasize <laughs> to all the donors out there, fund more research, because we just don't know enough about what's actually happening in order to therefore build policies, systems, projects, interventions that build on what's really happening and not an idea of what we think is happening or an idea of what we wish would be happening. So yeah, so that's that's my comment on that. Um, there's okay, so many- there's quite a few hands up, but I'm gonna, uh, uh, Namfundi so Gik was making the point in the Q&A that she agrees with you about the role of context in skills development. And then Nandipa is asking around people, how a skills development for people with disabilities and skills strategies. If you had yeah, I'm afraid that's that. outside of my, yeah, um, fair enough. My, my, my expertise, I, I really don't know anything about it. I okay. could comment on some of the other questions um, in the chat. Okay. Um, Ursula Nasi, um, a former employee, employee and um, still. Um, consultant to the Department of Higher Education and Training in South Africa has asked about, um, don't we need to understand demand in order to figure out where we could have niche apprenticeship programs? I, I'm not saying there's no need to understand demand. I'm saying that our formal systems are so focused on supply and demand as if it's a simple kind of machine model and they don't look at the full picture that we need to look at a whole lot of other issues beyond demand. Um, Particular and, and we need to be creating demand through structural economic change. Um, if we don't, there actually is very little demand in, 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 in South Africa, certainly. Mm. Thank you so much. So, Steph, there's about five hands up. So I'm going to let someone yes, speak. Absolutely, let people speak. I'll let them speak. And I'm going to allow Patrick Daru to, to, to ask you. And he's also put some points down. So, Patrick? Thank you very much, um, Stephanie. It's always a pleasure to, to hear you, you speak and it's always very thought provoking and inspirational, so thank you. Um, I, I think the idea of, of working more on the demand side uh, together with uh, skills um, intervention is not really a new one. I mean, I, I quoted in the uh, Q&A here, I mean, you, you see that already reflected in 2012, a call for action on youth employment. I think what is really new is the lifelong learning. And when you're talking about, you know, um, TVET system having to reshape their intervention and refocus on niche markets, I'm just wondering whether you're talking about initial formation or are you talking also about skills upgrading, um, upskilling programs uh, to, to facilitate this type of transformation and, and economic transformation that you're talking about. The second thing that I would like to, to mention is financing. And I think it's a, it's a thread below everything that you've been saying, you know? I think that in, in a lot of countries, you do not have a clear cut um, consensus on what the state is expected to finance when it comes to education. And when, you know, they, I think this is still very much open now. And when we, we're shifting to a lifelong learning concept, I think the debate is very much open on you know, what the state should pay for and who should pay for what as part of uh, adult education. So I, I'd be very interested to hear more from, from you on this. Thank you. Um, thanks, Patrick, and really great to hear from you. Um, it is true that I'm not, it's, it's building relationships between supply, <laughs> The supply side and demand side of the economy is not a new idea. Um, 
uh, certainly we've seen all of these rules and tools that I've been mentioning are set up precisely to do that. But what I'm trying to look at is why do they not seem to do that? What is it in developing countries that makes it the case that we don't seem to be getting that right? Um, and I think that one of the reasons is that we tr that we try to have a narrow match between skills and um, the, the, the skills that we think are needed in the economy. I mean, one reason, as I said repeatedly in South Africa, is that we have a, a very narrow um, mechanistic systems for aggregating employer um, analysis of their own demand, which is very limited. Um, so, and, and but then we try to we, we imagine that educational provision can respond to that instead of um, looking at what education institutions as part of society and as embedded in the economy can do what they're good at doing, which as I, as I mentioned earlier, and I, and I said, I, I, I couldn't go into the curriculum issues in this presentation, is about giving people access to bodies of knowledge, which help them in workplaces, which help them think about work, analyze work, um, respond to work, but this has to be done in a broad way with a very broad view to different kinds of jobs. At the same time, we need to look at what's really happening in the re in, in workplaces in terms of, and, and this is a, 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 what I think what you're talking about in terms of upskilling, lifelong learning, ongoing training, what's happening there and how we can better align um, the, those two different and, and other forms of education that is happening um, in, in um, workplaces and in formal educational provision. So, so that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that um, in order to think about that, the notion of supply and demand doesn't help us because it doesn't help us because when we look at demand, we, we, we ask employers, what do you need? You know, in the COVID skill strategy, when we looked at an aggregation of employer demand for the most important skill across the eco economy from all our different seaters, what they said was critical thinking. Now, you know, I'm sure most of you will agree that that's not um, an incredibly useful piece of information for an education provision system. Because employers, when you ask them, when you try and just anticipate demand in that, in that sense, you're not thinking about um, what it is that education actually can provide and how can it provide it. So rather we need to be thinking about education. What is education? What is important in education? How do we build education? How do we build education systems? How do we support access to them? As well as um, changing the structure of the economy. Does that mean building a particular sector? In order to build that sector, does the sector currently primarily rely on um, on the job training, if it does, how could that be supported? Do our funding mechanisms actually allow for that or don't they? Um, in many cases in our system, we have funding mechanisms which are there, we have funding there, but they don't seem to make it to the right places, often because of how the rules, how the rules and systems are set up. So, so that's really what I'm trying to argue and Lisa, I hope that um, talks to or uh, responds at least to some extent to your question because what I'm not at all saying that education should be based only on what's narrowly needed for work the opposite I'm saying that when we think about supply and demand we get trapped into thinking about this very narrow notion of let's just make the relevant skill and then it'll be produced what the employers want and then the employers always say that actually wasn't what we wanted what we're looking for is this um, so I'm saying rather let's look at the whole system and what different parts of the system can do, what is happening, what is working for um, employers, how we can support educational institutions, as opposed to this kind of um, supply and demand model, which most of our systems actually are, are working with. I hope that made sense and um, kind of uh, responded to um, to, to, to some of the comments in the in the in the um, panel um, in the chat. Hannah have you you've had your hand up for a while Hannah Dawson I you I've given you permission to ask your question welcome Hannah 
Sure, thanks. Um, Stephanie, that was that was great. Um, and I, um, I found it all very interesting and very useful, in particular kind of uh, your take on what explains the failure of, of vocational training as it connects to um, the expansion of secondary education and the fact that the formal sector, the formal economy, as it's sometimes called, is not generating enough jobs, um, and also agree with lots of what you said about the solution, um, or you know where we need, what the way we need to be thinking about it. But the thing that seems kind of largely, and I was absent in a sense, and that's what I'm interested in, to ask you more about, is you were making this distinction between kind of skills training being formal versus informal, and that often it's happening in informal ways. But it seemed you were still largely, and I missed the first five minutes of the talk, so I, I, I must have, I might have missed exactly what the the survey and the research you were working on focused on. But you were talking about informal skills formation happening, but largely in relation to formal sector workplaces. And it might be, you know, I think about. Um, so there's of course a huge informal economy. South Africa is maybe the exception to the rule, especially when we're talking about much of the continent. And so that's where jobs are being created at scale, have been for a long time and probably will do if we're honest about the reality of the future of work. Um, and, um, and how, to what extent does everything you've said around skills formation, if we think about it being embedded within societies and economies, um, what does actually taking the informal sector not just as a kind of micro, as, as a site of micro trading as it is in the South African context, but in much of the rest of the continent as this place in which so much manufacturing and retail um, work happens in. And I'm just wondering how, what that opens up that maybe you weren't able to, 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 to say uh, in, this, in this really interesting talk. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. It's a great question and our research hasn't looked at it. And, um, and in fact, the, the, the skills for industry research that I mentioned, we looked at only companies with more than 50 employees. Um, we have um, done some analysis in African countries, but I mean, there, there is, as I mentioned, a large body of literature, particularly in West Africa, looking at informal apprenticeships. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a really tricky question, but it is true that if we want to look at education and training for um, for the economies that exist, then most people work in the informal sector. It, it, it's a kind of a, and, and I guess partly why it's a conundrum is that vocational education is seen as a kind of a fix all. And so it, it has too wide a set of target audiences in, in most cases. And um, you know, one of the things that governments and donor agencies wanted to do is produce high level technical skills for industrialization. And countries that are trying to industrialize will often argue that they're failing because they don't have high levels of uh, high mid, highly trained mid-level, um, technically trained individuals. Mm. But when you're trying to build a formal TVET system that can do that, it's hard to do that when you've got rapidly expanding general education, rapidly expanding university education, a tiny formal sector, um, tiny uh, labor market employing in the formal sector, and most people in the informal sector are unemployed. So then, you know, the question that you're asking, I don't know the answer to. I mean, I think it's it's something that, that people have to research and think about. But what what kind of education do people need? Um, the MasterCard Foundation produced a report last year saying, um, you know, uh, what we need to do in secondary schools in Africa is have more 21st century skills and more critical thinking and more technical and vocational skills because that will prepare people for work in the employ in the informal sector it's not clear that there's a there's a there's a that there's a clear educational preparatory route for work in the informal sector that if you look at the research in the informal apprenticeships it's very very varied and mainly it's no, let me not say mainly, but there's many instances where it's kind of indentured labor with a bit of training. 
there's some instances where the training is more formalized. Um, so it, it's not an easy, um, it's not an easy solution, but it is where most people are working. And I think that South Africa will probably start changing um, and more like other African countries. And so it's something that South African policymakers will have to confront. But personally, I, I don't think that it's a phenomenon that has an educational solution, you know? And I think that we tend to look at difficulties in work or in society and go, oh, look, these people are struggling so much what how could training help it in many cases training can't help in many cases what's needed is is totally different um kinds of of interventions that aren't training related at all particularly in the context of mass school systems i mean it's true that our school systems are very are still low quality in 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 most instances in many african countries but they are improving and numbers are rising every year. Um, and, and it's not, you know, I think that it's just part of the general picture of the world in which in general, people are much more educated than they need to be for the kinds of work that are that's actually out there. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, we have to look at it, but it's not clear to me that there's an educational, there's a, there's a straightforward educational, um, answer to the conundrum, the set of issues that you're posing, which are absolutely important for thinking about societies and economies, particularly in Africa. I wish um, I wish we were in a room and we could actually <laughs> look at each other and, <laughs> and, and respond and engage more. This, this Zoom thing is kind of awful, but yeah. Steph, Alison Taylor uh, is asking if you had any reflections on the pandemic and uh, what the pandemic re uh, highlighted around vet systems and whether the pandemic had any influence in how in the kind of analysis you were doing and how you worked with it in the work that you were doing yeah that's a it's a great question mm. i mean i think that um just to go back to my previous point on zoom i mean look it's great that we can all connect like this um and i appreciate it and i appreciate everyone coming and talking and asking questions and engaging. So, um, but I think that the pandemic has really highlighted how limited learning online is. And I think that particularly for vocational education, and I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm really speaking from the South African experience and the research that we've done here, but it, it was so hard hit by the pandemic. Um, you know, <laughs> most, of the college lecturers have very little, obviously none of us have training, well, I certainly don't in online teaching. Our college lecturers have very little, um, but never mind that, even the lecturers often don't have data and devices and, and, and maybe a quiet room in which they can teach from. When we go to the learners, um, there are so many parts of this country that have poor um, network coverage or no network coverage. There are, so few households in which people have a room in which they can put up a computer and talk to people on a screen. Never mind, do they have a device, which most of them don't. So I think that um, one of the things that really the pandemic highlighted for me in relation to VET is the importance of face-to-face -face learning. I mean, obviously that's crucial in terms of workplace learning and what we really saw um, was, I mean, we know, obviously, during the lockdown, there was no workplace learning. But when the lockdown eased, and people started going back to work, the people who didn't, who were not welcome back into the workplace were trainees, because workplaces were very restricted in terms of the numbers that they can take. So, um, yeah, I think that for me, it really emphasized the importance of building educational institutions, the importance of educational institutions as part of societal interaction. And I think that's why for me, I really believe in um, while, while we need focused policies that support the specific skills that are needed by specific industries, we need, we will continue to need alongside general education, alongside schools, institutions where young people can go, can learn, um, some language, some maths, and be exposed to 
some aspects of different workplaces, which is what we get in South Africa. We call them technical and vocational education colleges. They're called different things in different countries. But I think that um, that kind of institutional face-to-face -face learning is, is so important. And for me, the pandemic highlighted how important it is for individuals, for communities, for societies, and why institutions have to be really um, built and supported and developed. Because what a crisis makes obvious is institutions don't have excess capacity. They are absolutely on their bare bones. And suddenly we say, oh, look, there's a new demand. Employers now need this. They don't have, um, you know, excess staff who can do research into this new occupational area, develop a new curriculum and et cetera. So that's why um, they need excess capacity as opposed to the minimum capacity. If we really want the kind of short-term responsiveness that we, want, that we need, as well as the broad educational goals that um, for me, vocational education institutions should also and can also, and in many cases do also meet um, and which they couldn't do during the pandemic. So, so thanks for that question. I think it's a great one. Okay. So there, there are two questions here, one from Vivian and uh, one from Farad again, and uh, they're both kind of broad reflective questions. So I'll give them both to you together. So Farad is saying, so, are you so so you suggesting changing a perspective from supply demand model of education to a consolidated model of education and economy? Would you like to reflect on that a little? That's a, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, and then Vivian's, Vivian's is equally reflective because she's asking you, who or what then do you think determines the relevance or irrelevance of education? So, I mean, we're going to be here all night while you answer those. Yeah. Uh, those are, in relation to the first question, I, I, I don't, I would not like to talk about a model. Yeah. Um, I think we need to move away from kind of quick fix, um, simple solutions. And so all that I'm trying to say is, let's stop using terms that don't help us to really look at the issues and the problems. Um, we need a set of uh, different and diverse policies to build um, different aspects of our systems. Um, yeah, relevance is such a complex <laughs> issue. Um, and and uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great issue. It's a really important issue. It's an issue that perplexes a lot of um, educational researchers. One of the things that I'll just say is that um, you don't always know what's relevant in the immediate. And, and that's one of the reasons why when we're thinking about educational provision, we can't be only responding to narrow lists of, of skill demands. Um, because, you know, and, and Sylvia made the, the point um, so well in her question, you know, employers don't always know what they're going to need next month. So we can't be thinking that um, what is relevant um, now will be relevant later. We have to be, so when we're designing educational curricula, we have to be doing so in ways that are broader, that are building um, bodies of knowledge that will be applied across a whole range of different contexts, um, places, interventions. Because we don't, you know, we, we can't, they, they, there's never a one on one relationship between any body of knowledge and any task in a workplace. Um, you need to learn anatomy in order to be a doctor, even though not every single piece of the anatomy that you learn will always be relevant to every task that you're performing. So the, there's no way of deciding this is relevant and this isn't relevant. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that we need, on the one hand, broad offerings that build bodies of knowledge and some um, insight into the world of work and the economy um, in some of them. But we also need policies, funding mechanisms, systems that can help to, um, to, to, to develop short-term training programs where there is 
a, a very recognized and clear need in a particular industry. And that, I think that's what we don't have enough of, certainly in South Africa and in some other countries that I have studied as well. So yeah, so I think there's no simple answer to what is relevant knowledge, what is a relevant skill, what is a relevant education program. Okay, great. Okay, Steph, so the rest of it are mostly comments uh, and, and you've kind of covered broadly. So it's 25 past five. I don't know if you want to make any last comments, Steph, before. No, I think I just to emphasize that um, it's, it's really a complex set of issues. And um, yeah, Bill, <laughs> um, possibly. I don't think, um, sorry, I'm just responding to Bill's um, mm -hmm. question in the chat and I realize he, it's posted to the panelists. He says, won't your specialized technical route lead to a two level system? I think that in actually in the South African context and in most poor countries, there's no chance of a, of a two le level system because there's no chance of a mass vocational system. So right. actually what we need um, and, and our vocational colleges are really largely compensatory education with a bit of workplace preparation, not all of their courses, but that is the kind of main role that they play. If you look at who they enroll, um, they mainly enroll um, people who finished secondary school, people who finished senior secondary school. So I think that, you know, my own view is that we need really niche, really specialized programs when we're looking at direct preparation for the workplace and much broader programs which are much more embedded in general educational offerings um, otherwise because I just don't think there's ever going to be any appetite for them otherwise so um, yeah but it's a, it's a good question and um, I think yeah let's it's a it's a really complex set of issues um, and what I wasn't actually really trying to do <laughs> is develop a new set of policy models or a new set of policy, um, but rather some broad ideas for thinking for how we can think better about skill formation, um, thinking about the role of education in the economy, thinking about different education institutions, thinking about curriculum and knowledge, thinking about employers and what they need and how we can maybe start thinking about all of these things in different ways that lead to more productive solutions because you know we just have our continent is littered with um as as mike asked about um poli failed policy interventions that that haven't solved these problems by trying to align supply and demand of education. So I was trying to say, let's stop thinking about it from the lens of supply and demand, but I'm not saying that I've got a, a new model or a new system or new, um, I'm really just trying to throw out some different ways of thinking about these issues, learning from um, what is actually happening in um, poor middle income developing countries. So yeah, I think that the issues are complex and that's why we're having the seminar series. We're so um, happy to be able to engage with all of you in it. Um, and uh, Preach, I don't know, shall I put up yeah. The, um, yeah. the, the last um, slide? Yeah, slide. So thank you so much, Steph. I and mean, you can see the comments the... coming. It, for very skillfully bringing together what we know is a wide range of work. And uh, you've actually given people a lot to consider and contemplate and try to open up some of the complexities. So again, colleagues, thank you for joining us. Uh, you will find the uh, seminar today's, the recording of today's seminar on the YouTube channel and the link was shared early, uh, earlier on, but we will share the slides, Stephanie slides, as well as the link to the YouTube recording. So we, uh, we invite you to all, please go on to YouTube and you can register or subscribe to, to the real YouTube and all of the different seminars are on the YouTube link already. Just a quick uh, update. I did, I did put the link up there in the earlier slides. Yes, so, and, but and I think the link the also emailed yeah. it to everyone. And um, I just do want to emphasize our master's program because I think that what the seminar makes so clear is that we need more researchers in this area. 
And we really welcome the opportunity to train researchers who want to do more research in this area, um, particularly on the African content, continent, because it is such an under-researched set of issues. Yeah, absolutely. For ending then, without advertising. Yeah, thanks, Steph. And then just to say that some of the upcoming ones, we will be sharing four of our PhDs that were graduated last year. We had four PhDs at the center. We'll be sharing some of their recent work and and some of the upcoming seminars which you will find and since you're all in our databases now you will get the invitations to we've got our colleague also doing research work in africa with us uh leslie powell from nmu and then we've got uh professor buchanan from australia we've got a, another forthcoming seminar with professor johnny sung uh, from singapore and uh Professor uh, Susan James Riley from Oxford, from the Scopey Skills Research Center at Oxford. So there's a lot of exciting uh, webinars that are still coming up in the series, and we're hope we're hoping that we're going to see you there a lot along the way. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you again, Stephanie, for that really, really wonderful, thought-provoking seminar that brought together many, many different uh, issues and and thoughts. So bye everyone. Keep well. Cheers everyone. Thanks for all the Thank questions. And Prish. Bye. Bye, bye Alessa. Bye. To bye. I know Sylvia, I didn't completely answer one of yours. But we'll have to talk another time. Bye everyone.